The survivor on the highway kept waving, just hoping that the person driving would help him. Rick's mood remained unchanged. Unknowingly, the heart of this upright police officer had also become indifferent. Now he only showed tenderness to the people around him. Returning to the topic, the three of them soon arrived at the small town where Rick used to live. The purpose of this trip was to find guns and ammunition to fight against Governor. When they arrived on the street, they were shocked. The place was full of sharpened bamboo, made into various traps to block the way. It was obvious that it was used to deal with the zombies, and someone had already occupied the place. Rick couldn't retreat. He used to be the town's police officer, and he knew who had guns in their homes. He hoped to get lucky and find some. At this moment, a zombie followed them and bumped into a rope, making a clanging sound. Immediately afterwards, a heavily armed man with a gun shouted for Rick to put his hands up and drop what he was holding and leave the area, including the knife they were holding. Giving them 10 seconds, Rick let Carl hear the signal and ran towards the back of the car. The man had already started the countdown. When he counted to six, Rick shouted for Carl to run. The three of them were now very safe behind the obstacles. Rick loaded his gun and prepared to counterattack, but the man had disappeared. Michonne also arrived at the top floor. The man appeared on the first floor, walking and shooting, completely focused on Rick. Rick hid behind the barrel has no way to escape, is about to surprise the sneak attack, hiding in the side of Carl shot directly down the man. Even Michonne was surprised by this little guy. However, Carl was still criticized and educated by Rick, and was told that in the next dangerous situation, he could only hide. Rick knocked on the man's back, clearly wearing a bulletproof vest. When he lifted it, he found that the bullet had not gone through, and the man had probably passed out from the pain. When Rick took off his mask, he was shocked. It was Morgan. Rick can't leave him alone. Without Morgan, he would have died long ago. Now, he could only carry him upstairs first. When they entered the room, they were surprised to find so many weapons. Even the police station didn't have so many. How many places had Morgan searched? With that, he was placed on the bed. Michonne and Carl quickly packed the weapons. Rick noticed that even under the bed were guns. Then he was attracted by the words on the wall. Two prominent red letters. Then there are all kinds of strange words. What had happened to Morgan? There was no time to think about it. Pick some weapons to take away first. When Rick picked up a gun, he found the walkie-talkie he had given to Morgan. He promised to contact Morgan every morning, but he forgot about it during the escape. Then Rick saw the words on the wall, saying that Dwayne had turned into a zombie. He couldn't believe that Morgan's son had died. What a blow it must have been for him. Rick was worried about Morgan's condition and decided to wait for him to wake up here. Michonne and Carl strongly opposed it. Morgan had almost killed them just now. It's already considered lucky for him that they didn't leave him downstairs. They didn't understand the significance of Morgan to Rick. After some thought, Rick decided to tie up Morgan's hands since he was clearly mentally unstable. Carl and his father offered to look for supplies. There was a baby store downstairs that his mother's friend used to run, and he wanted to find baby supplies for his sister. Michonne decided to accompany Carl on his search, and Rick eventually agreed. After a while, Rick picked up a sniper rifle that he had given to Morgan before. As he was examining it, Morgan suddenly pounced on him. Rick instinctively knocked him down. Rick repeatedly asked Morgan if he knew who he was and if he recognized him. Morgan shouted that Rick was a devil with a human face and then lunged at him with a knife. Rick tried to resist while also attempting to awaken Morgan. Morgan's strength was too great, and he easily knocked Rick to the ground, yelling that Rick was not human and that he wanted to kill him. The knife plunged directly into Rick's shoulder. Rick fought back without holding back taking out his gun and cursing while pointing it at Morgan's head. To Rick's surprise, Morgan begged him to pull the trigger and kill him. When Morgan calmed down, Rick put away his gun. Morgan cried uncontrollably, and to prevent him from causing any more trouble, Rick had to tie him to a table. Morgan kept pleading with Rick to kill him. Rick picked up the walkie-talkie and told Morgan that he had given it to him and promised to contact him every morning so that Morgan could find him. Upon hearing this, Morgan finally remembered Rick's name and apologized for stabbing him. Morgan continued, saying that he and his son sat on the roof and called out for Rick every day for several weeks. But then it was just him. There is always noise on the walkie-talkie. Rick said he would contact them, but he didn't, and Morgan's emotions flared up as he spoke as if blaming Rick for not contacting them and giving them this hope. Rick could only say that they were forced to flee and had to keep moving further away. He found his wife and son. Morgan blames Rick, but he actually running away from reality. Rick had given Morgan many guns, and he had tried to kill his zombified wife, but could not bear to do it. 
In the end, tragedy struck when they were looking for supplies, and his wife attacked their son. If Morgan had killed his wife, their son would still be alive. With guilt and sadness Morgan becomes eccentric. As Rick listened to Morgan's story, he could feel his despair, he was also a father. After a while, both of them calmed down, and Rick told Morgan that they could get through this together. But Morgan's mental state was pessimistic, and he didn't want to go anywhere. In the end, the three of them left with some of the guns. Before they left, Rick looked back with deep helplessness. He didn't know how to help Morgan, and his own life was a mess. While they were packing up, Carl told his father that Michonne was a good person and that they should let her stay. He had enjoyed spending time with her while they were looking for supplies. Thanks to Carl's words, Rick agreed to let Michonne stay. When they returned to the cell, Glenn was in charge of organizing the guns. They couldn't imagine how Rick had found so many weapons. After a while, Maggie found Glenn on duty, and they were finally able to have a good conversation. Taking this opportunity, Glenn apologizes to Maggie, who only thinks of himself during this time. Maggie needs space, and he is being aggressive. Maggie responded that they didn't need space between them. She just wanted Glenn to know that she would always be there for him. Finally, the small couple reconciled. At this moment, Rick and his group were not in prison. They received an invitation from Andrea to come to the farm for peace negotiations. Rick took a strong stance and proposed that the town should own the land west of the river, and the prison should own the land to the east, with clear boundaries to avoid conflict. However, the governor refused this proposal. With that, governor let Andrea out. Rick thought governor wanted the prison place. Governor laughed. He didn't want prison, what he wanted was Michonne for. Rick was silent because he did not know what Michonne had done. The governor gave Rick two days to consider his proposal and left. Back at the prison, Rick told his group that the governor wanted to destroy them because they destroyed his town. Rick was conflicted about whether to give up Michonne for their safety. Herschel comforted Rick and reminded him that they were family and had to stick together no matter what. And governor returned to the town. He immediately instructed his men. Two days later in the negotiation site to ambush the gunman, once they see Rick and Michonne brought over, immediately open fire to kill the others. Milton was confused by the governor's plan and hoped for peace. Governor smiled. By then the main force of the prison will come. They want to take out this group of people to eliminate forever. Andrea was unaware of the governor's plan and was pleased with the negotiations. In the evening, the governor came to his secret base, already ready to torture Michonne props. Just imagine the excitement of the scene. The next day, Milton found that the self-defense forces were carrying heavy weapons and were supposedly preparing to ambush the prison. Milton tried to persuade the governor to stop using violence, but his efforts were in vain. Milton told Andrea about the governor's plan to kill Michonne and everyone at the prison. Milton then took Andrea to the governor's secret base. A chair prepared for Michonne. This pervert wanted Michonne to feel the pain of losing her eyes too. Andrea realized she had made a mistake and decided to kill the governor. However, Milton stopped her and explained that killing the governor would not solve anything. He suggests that she go and inform Rick and his team to escape. Andrea drew her gun in anger and got out of there. Andrea did not understand why Milton protected the governor. Milton explained that if Andrea killed the governor, she would not be able to leave the town alive. The governor's men would not spare anyone at the prison. The only option was to inform Rick and his team. Andrea understood and left to warn them. She said goodbye to Milton. Andrea rushed out onto the street, ready to slip away at any moment. But she was stopped by the town's militia. The governor had decreed that all residents must surrender their weapons. So Andrea reluctantly handed over the weapons Rick had given her, while the militia was collecting the weapons. Andrea quickly made her way to the gate, where she was confronted by Tyrese and his sister. Seeing that the two wanted to ask a clear question, she directly took out the dagger. Tyrese said they didn't need to hurt each other. Andrea thinks that Tyrese's siblings are good people. Explained that she needed to leave and that the governor was not what he seemed. Sasha was confused. As she found the governor to be very charming and trustworthy, Andrea directly retorted that she thought so at first, but governor had done countless despicable things. She had to get out of here and let the Tyrese siblings go, too. And the two did not stop and let her leave. Andrea ran straight away, and if governor had found out, he would have gone after her. After a while, Tyrese and his sister were called to the warehouse and the governor asked them why they had let Andrea go. Tyrese replied that they couldn't just kill Andrea and that they were there to keep the zombies out and not to prevent people from going out. The governor pretends to be concerned about Andrea, saying that he was worried about her being outside alone and putting herself in danger. He seemed very sincere and convincing. Tyrese and his sister did not reveal what Andrea had told them and said they didn't know the reason for her departure. After the governor left, 
Milton immediately went to talk to him and suggested that he let Andrea go and be with her friends at the prison, however, when Milton mentioned that Andrea only wanted to be with her friends, the governor realized that Milton had told Andrea about his plans and became furious. He realized that if Andrea made it to the prison, all of his plans would be for nothing, governor plans to go after Andrea himself. Andrea left the town and ran wildly, but soon there were cars driving, must be to chase her. I do not know how long it took to get rid of a lot of zombies and finally came to the prison, Andrea saw Rick on the watchtower and excitedly raised her hand to get his attention, but Rick only glanced briefly and did not notice her he took a closer look with his binoculars but saw nothing out of the ordinary, thinking that he was hallucinating again.